And so what happened was when we were putting my grandfather into the ground, I had to ask myself at this moment, you know, Ibrahim, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to allow this legacy to die here and now and be buried in the ground with your grandfather? Or are you going to pick up the banner for yourself and carry it forth into the future? And that was the beginning, I would say, of my transformation when I really start to, you know, bring out my Islamic identity and to be open about who I was as a Muslim. And, you know, I was, I began to chase that legacy that I was running from. I began to chase it for myself. And as Allah would have it, in his wisdom, I wasn't drafted to any NBA team at that particular time. In fact, I was sent across seas. My agents, they didn't tell me the whole truth. They said nobody was interested. And I found out years later that wasn't exactly true. But I went overseas. I began to refine and redefine myself and to study. You know, I remember I used to pray sometimes in the night for hours. You know, and I would be reading everything that I had ever memorized, you know, during that short time that I was in Morocco. And I was just trying to cleanse myself and to make toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I'm going through that, he's putting barakah on the basketball court that I became the leading scorer in the Greek league. And only after four months, they were buying my contract in the Euro League in Italy. And he continued to bless me, right? But it's just as I said, the higher up you go, the thinner the air. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Amma ba'd, I'm your brother Ibrahim Muhammad Hisham Jabber, um, uh, third generation American born Muslim, and as many of you would know, I'm a former professional basketball player, and I spent most of my basketball career um, in Europe, playing in Italy, um, for Roma and Milano, also in Greece, playing for a team called Igalio, which was in Athens. Um, in Lithuania, played for Kaunas, uh, the Bulgarian national team. Um, and also, I tried out for a bunch of NBA teams, some of your favorite teams probably. Any NBA fans, raise your hand. Let me see who I'm talking to today. Okay, just three people that like the NBA, right? So this whole conversation we're about to have is obsolete. But anyway, tried out for the Lakers. I tried out for the Golden State Warriors, the Houston Rockets. Um, is the check from Toronto here? He's not here yet, right? Okay. Uh, the Raptors in Toronto and um, the Detroit Pistons and so forth and so on. Um, and alhamdulillah, uh, by Allah's permission, it was a very beneficial experience. I gained a lot of life experience traveling to different places, meeting a lot of different people, being put in... Uh, challenging circumstances. You know, when I look at basketball, I don't just see basketball, but I see divine cultivation. I see it as a mechanism that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he put into my life as something that would um, I would grow through and that he would use to shape me and develop a certain type of personality. And I think a lot of us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us something in our life that would shape us and cultivate us. And we even see this in the lives of the prophets, alayhi salatu wa salam, uh, all of them, right, who he made shepherds. And this was a part of their uh, preparation that they would in the future become uh, prophets and they would have to be shepherds, not of sheep, but of the believers, right? And so I see it as something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me so that I can grow as a young man. And through it, I was able to travel the world. Through it, I was able to get a, a university degree. Through it, I was able to avoid, you know, the gang culture in urban America, you know, coming from, I would say, the African-American community where, you know, the social pressures are heavier than any other racial background in America. Alhamdulillah. Um, and I would say I have somewhat of a legacy of basketball in my family, that my grandfather, Hisham, Rahimahullah, he played basketball before his Islam. He played in the military, all army, and he traveled and he played and competed in places like Berlin and traveled over North Africa where he would eventually be exposed to Islam. And my father and my uncles, they, were, uh, they inherited that from him and they were into basketball and martial arts. 
And then I have four older brothers, which would make me number five, the fifth player on the team. And so we would go to any park and we would, we would challenge anybody, right? And if we lost and you were the reason we lost, right, you're going to have to hear it all the way back home. And then when you get home, you're still in trouble, right? And um, even my mother, before she embraced Islam, she's a revert, whereas my father was born Muslim, right? She's the one, she says, you inherited your basketball ability from me, right? Because she used to play basketball before she embraced Islam. But just as I have a legacy of basketball, I'm talking fast because I want to honor the time. And I hope you can understand my low-level English, not like my big brother over here, mashallah. His, his English is like up here, mashallah. It's just as tall as he is, or even taller. <laughs> Right, just as I have a legacy of basketball, I also have a legacy of dawah in my family. Right, my grandfather, who I mentioned, who was playing basketball all army before his Islam, he also, when he embraced Islam in the 1950s, through an organization called the Adino Lahi Universal Arabic Association, that is on record as one of the oldest Sunni Orthodox Islamic organizations ever to be founded in America, dating back to the 1920s. And he embraced Islam through this organization, alhamdulillah. Um, and eventually, through his diligence, he would become the national imam for this organization. And he would travel even to places in Africa where it said that he would give hundreds of shahada. Allahu Akbar. And even until this day, <laughs> subhanAllah. <clears throat> I don't like to talk about my grandfather in public. <clears throat> Even until this day, I would meet people in New Jersey, where I'm from, and they would say, you know, your grandfather gave me shahada. And we're talking about a time when America was black and white. This was predating the influx of immigrants coming in from Morocco and Egypt and different places across the Arab world. America was black and white. And they had been indoctrinated upon Christianity, and he was one of the few people going to, you know, take these people out of darkness and bring them into light. And so they would see me and they say, your grandfather gave me shahada, right? They would see me and they say, oh, you know, your grandfather, he did our nikah, right? One time I was at a masjid. Um, I didn't know anybody there. I was there for a meeting with a brother and I'm walking and there's a table and a Sudanese brother, he's sitting at the table and he looks at me as I'm walking past. He points and he says, he's Sham, which is my grandfather's name. And he was able to see that just from my features. And subhanAllah, he said, um, I was with your grandfather, right? And if you ever uh, saw my grandfather, we're opposite complexions, right? If he was in the room right now, he would be the darkest person in the room, right? But somehow he was looking at me and he said, he sham. You know, and that was something that, you know, almost brought tears to my eyes. And my grandfather is most well known for his participation in the burial of Malcolm X. Right, he's the one who performed the janazah for Malcolm X. So if you ever look online and you see the person, the dark man in the Saudi garb, he has on the cloak and the white uh, uh, scarf and the black ring, that's my grandfather standing over Malcolm performing the janazah prayer. Right, and these are the stories, I'm talking about the legacy of da'wah that I inherit in my family, right? These are the stories that I heard growing up, you know, about my grandfather. You know, I had a living legend, a living hero in my life. And my father and my uncles, they would follow in his footsteps and they would carry on that legacy of da'wah and they would be the imams and they would be the, the du'at, you know, inviting people to Islam, right? Almost everybody in my family, at some point in their life, they took on some type of Arabic name, right? That's how busy they were in the da'wah, right? But growing up as a young person, my father's the one on the imam, on, on the minbar. My uncle's the one on the minbar. My grandfather's the one on the minbar, right? And that had a very deep and profound impact upon me. Let me catch my breath, I'm out of shape. <laughs> right? So I'm born and I grow up between two legacies, a legacy of basketball and a legacy of dawah. Right, but as a young person, as you can imagine, I spent most of my time chasing the legacy of basketball and running away from the legacy of doubt. Right, the last thing that I wanted to be was an imam. <laughs> no offense, right, to the imam. The last thing that I wanted to be was a da'i. 
You know, subhanAllah, don't ask me anything about Islam. You know, and I want you to understand that my family was always the only Muslim family on the block. And I was always the only Muslim kid in my class or on my team, right? And I didn't have the language to articulate the, the beliefs that I had, right? And so I would shy away from any conversation about Islam. In fact, there was nothing really apparently Muslim about me, except, of course, my name, right? That the teachers, they always seemed to mess up my name. They couldn't say Ibrahim, right? Ib Ibram, you know, they would embarrass me in front of the class, right? So eventually, Ibrahim became E-B. It became Ibi. It became E, E-double. You know, we got fancy sometimes, right? And so I was able to uh, blend in. In fact, my hair was out to here. You can imagine, right? I would pull my hair down, and I, it would come all the way down to my chest. And I, sometimes I would braid it back and so forth and so on. So if you saw me in a crowd of regular American kids, right, you wouldn't even notice me, right? Um, however, I, I guess there were some people, they would, they would catch me breaking my fast. That's for me? MashaAllah. Jay, MashaAllah. Don't just put it there, okay? Don't come too close. He's trying to get the ball. He's, he challenged me backstage, right? <laughs> right. Uh, sometimes I, I, I would be caught breaking my fast, you know? I would have to leave from basketball practice or something of this nature. And, you know, people had questions. Those, you didn't know they were, they were looking. So as much as I'm running away from this legacy of, uh, of da'wah, as much as this legacy... It's chasing after me. It's chasing me. Ibrahim, where you going? You can't get away from me. Right? It's in your blood. <laughs> right? From my father, who used to come up on a random weekend, and you think you're about to go out to the park and spend hours in the park, and he said, no, we're having class today. And what he meant was we're going to sit there for five hours <laughs> until he ran out of breath. Right? And all of my brothers, um, Lukman, Yusuf, Abdul Aziz, Ismail, they had already fallen asleep 20 minutes into the class, and I was the only one that was too shy to just fall asleep in front of my father, right? So I would have to sit through the whole class. And when I was 13, he came to me, he said, okay, we're moving to Morocco. And I'm like, what? You know, Morocco? Wait, we just won the middle school championship in basketball. You know, I'm doing well on the traveling team. We're going to Morocco, right? So 10 months, we went to Morocco. Uh, we started memorizing Quran. We were exposed to the Arabic language, the culture over there. We have the Moroccan sheikh here too, right? Darul Bayda. We were in Muhammad. We were in Muhammadiyah, which is a village outside of uh, Darul Bayda, and it was one of the most spiritually impactful experiences that I ever had. My man, you know, at that particular point in my life, was like, "Whoa!" You know, I got to see the the ummah as opposed to being the only kid on the block and the only family on the block. Right? And that was a very profound experience. In fact, my father, he made, the, he made me the mu'adhan. Right? So that meant that I had to wake up before everybody else to call the adhan. Right? So he had special plans for me that I was the one designated to call the people to the prayer. Right? Just like my, my namesake, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And then at the age of 15, I started teaching myself how to write poetry and how to write rhymes. And I had no idea that this would actually be something that I would use to connect with the Muslim youth and to convey the message of Islam to the people, right? I had no idea when I picked up the pen that this was going to come in handy, right? And I put out a poem. Actually, I didn't even put it out myself. I, do, I have a poem called Brainwash Complete. Anybody seen this poem? Raise your hand. Hurry up. We don't have a lot of time. Hands up. Okay, five people. We're getting better, right? I think some people are looking me up now on their phones. <laughs> MashaAllah. But this poem, Brainwash Complete, um, uh, organization in Australia uh, filmed it, and then they actually did some special effects, and they put it online without my permission or without me knowing. And by the time I saw it, it had like over 40,000 views, right? And then it passed 100,000 and went up, uh, I think, almost to the millions and so forth and so on, right? But I'm in the airport about to travel to a conference, and some random young lady comes up to me, non-Muslim, and she said, do you do YouTube videos? And I'm like, you know, yeah, but everybody does YouTube videos, you know what I mean? She's like, no, no, you look like this guy from Brainwash Complete, you know? And so that poem reached the non-Muslim community, 
And, you know, the fact that she came up and she said, everything that you said was so true. You know, may Allah guide her to Islam. You know, and I hear stories also from uh, Muslim people who have heard uh, one of my poems, Scripture, My Hope. And they said, you know, that, that poem had a profound impact upon me. A sister once came to me saying that she was just ready to take off her hijab. You know, but that poem hit her right in that spot in the heart. And she said she made her intentions to make Umrah after that. And she made Umrah and she held on to her hijab. And she was, you know, when I met her, she was on her deen, alhamdulillah. Right. But these were things I had no idea would be beneficial in terms of, you know, the work of da'wah. Um, then my father, as I was 16, he make, made me work at a youth camp. Yeah, let me get this water. Whew. I haven't actually spoken in like over a year and a half. I'm, I'm living in Egypt. I'm studying with and I have my family there. That's how I actually came into contact with um, uh, my brother, my beloved, you know, my best friend in Egypt. Uh, Fahd, mashallah, and that's how I'm here with you all today, right? So I'm a little bit out of breath. <laughs> at 16, my father, he made me like the youth counselor at a little camp um, that we had over the summer for the Muslim kids. And so I would actually have to counsel uh, younger kids, 10 years old, 9 years old, um, and uh, many of them had behavioral challenges. You, you can't imagine you know, the rough environment, urban America that I'm talking about, you know, psychological issues that we're dealing with. And they used to gravitate towards me. And they would be on their best behavior as long as I was watching, as long as I was present, right? But as soon as I turn my back, you hear the glass breaking <laughs> and the screams in the background, right? And that was a part of my development. I had to read from like the books of the prophets, the stories of the prophets, and I had no idea what I was actually being prepared to do. Um, as I got into college and I began to progress as a basketball player, it gets tighter and tighter the higher up you go, right? They say the higher up you go, the thinner the air, right? The tighter the situation. And so we're talking about post 9-11 now, right? 9-11 happened when I was a senior in high school, right? You know, Ibrahim, what your cousin's doing? <laughs> you know, tell your cousins to calm down. <laughs> right, these are the kind of jokes that my so-called friends, right, used to make. <laughs> right, and um, as I was gaining success as a basketball player, um, sometimes the reporters, they would ask me questions, right? And again, I was still shying away from those questions, unable to articulate, you know, what I believed in as a person, and still trying to blend in you know, with everybody else. I'm just like everybody else, you know, except my name is a little bit strange, you know, compared to yours, right? Um, in my college years, I actually call them like the dark ages. You know, it was probably the time where I struggled most with my, my religion. And alhamdulillah, I don't have the time to go into details about that, but I had some things that I dealt with at that time. And as I'm coming to my senior year, I get two letters. One letter is from somebody that I went to high school with. They ended up uh, going off to prison. And these are, you know, we actually played basketball on the same high school team. But we weren't really friends. You know, I couldn't tell you where he lived or much about him. But somehow this letter reached me while I was at college going through hard times. And in this letter, he mentioned, number one, that he had embraced Islam. Yeah, alhamdulillah. And he mentioned in the letter that he remembered me fasting as a high school player and me going off to break my fast. And he said that made him wonder and be curious about Islam, right? Until finally one day he actually researched and he uh, embraced Islam for himself. And subhanAllah, after my basketball career uh, had finished and I went back to the States and began to work in, in the arena of da'wah, um, we actually became very close friends to the point that we actually, a few years ago, we made itikaf together, right? Ten days strong. And we would, you know, sit down and we would read the Quran and we would reflect on the ayat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both of us were just amazed, you know, to say like, I never would have imagined ten years ago when we were in high school together. Excuse me, twenty years ago. <laughs> I'm only 34, right? Um, when we were in high school together, I never would have imagined that we would be friends like this, reading the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together, right? 
And we were both baffled about that. The other letter that I received, and my mother, she was always the one delivering the message to me, right? Oh, you got a letter. Oh, you got a letter. It was from my brother, my older brother. And he said in this letter that, you know, he apologized for not being the best example of a Muslim that he could have possibly been for us, you know. And he was encouraging us to embrace Islam and to take the deen serious and to, you know, do your best in whatever situation you are to hold fast to your identity. You know, and at that time in my life, you know, these are the type of things that used to just pierce my heart deeply. And after three Ivy League championships, right, I was the um, two-time Ivy League player of the year, big five player of the year. I have records that will, and Allah knows best, will not be broken at the University of Pennsylvania until the, the day of judgment. <laughs> <laughs> and Allah Ta'ala, he knows best. In terms of, uh, you know, I, was, <laughs> um, I have the record in still. So still, defense was my specialty because my, my parents, uh, my, my father and my uncle, they went into martial arts. So they had that defensive mentality, and I inherited that from them. And um, I shattered the still records by almost two times. So, like, I think the person's closest to me, he has, like, a hundred and... 50 or something, 160 steals, and I'm up in the 300s. You know, I broke it early in my junior year, right? So, and I say Allah knows best. That one might stay, right, in the books until Yom Al Qiyamah, inshallah. I mean, <laughs> right? As I'm approaching the end of my college career and getting ready to go to, into the NBA tryouts, those teams that I mentioned, My grandfather fell sick. My grandfather fell sick, and my tour was Golden State, Houston, Detroit, and the last stop was Charlotte, North Carolina. And my brother, my older brother who had sent me this uh, letter, he was living in Charlotte, North Carolina with his Moroccan wife at that time, right? And so I planned to stay with him and then go back up home to New Jersey um, with him. And so when I got to Charlotte, I tried out for the Bobcats. Michael Jordan was the GM at that time. It was the hardest workout that I'd ever been through, and we were short one person. So that means you had to do almost double the work, right? So I was exhausted by the time I got to my brother. We went up to, he, we're riding up to New Jersey, and he said, you know, your grandfather's sick. And, um, you know, you have to go visit him because we don't know how much longer that he's going to live, right? And this is my hero that he's talking about, my grandfather. And so... Um, I definitely honored his instructions when I went up to New Jersey. Um, I made sure I got to the hospital. And it was a, one of those cleansing life experience, a real life moment that you go through. As I arrived at the hospital, I step into the doorway and uh, my grandfather's laying on the bed and my grandmother, she's putting something away in her bag. And so the first person that sees me is my grandfather. And then his, fight, my, his face, it lights up as he sees me. And then my grandmother looks up and she sees me. And I come into the room, I embrace my, my grandmother and I give her a kiss and then I go to my grandfather and I grab his hand and I stand by his side. And my grandmother, she says, you know, we were just talking about you, right? And then she reached back in her bag and what she was actually putting away was my basketball card. And she had another card of my brother, Luke Mann, who also was playing college basketball. She said, we were just talking about you, right? <laughs> um, which was a bit ironic. And as I was there, he could barely uh, stand on his own at that particular time. And a few weeks later, um, he would pass away. And this is just as I'm finishing my college career. And um, the janaza is probably one of the things that impacted me the most. <laughs> Oof. I apologize. <laughs> the cars were so many. For my grandfather's Janaza, that the highway was backed up literally for miles and miles. <laughs> we shut down the whole highway. And then the cemetery, it was, you know, wrapped around with cars. There were no there was no space to park. And there was so many people there, and everybody was, you know, no, I want to carry it. I want to carry the casket. Everybody was, so the imam, he made them line up from the hearse all the way to the grave, 
right, so that they could pass the casket, right? It was the people that he had given shahada. It was the people that even many of the immigrants who came into America from imams to, to regular people, he helped them get their paperwork and get established, you know, when they came into the, uh, into the United States, right? And it was the first time that my family had been all back together, you know, after years being spread out across the United States, all the way down to Atlanta and New York uh, in, in uh, Philadelphia and Virginia and Cleveland. And I start to see the, the impact that my grandfather had, you know, uh, in terms of da'wah and just, you know, embracing the legacy of Islam. And so what happened was when we were putting my grandfather into the ground, I had to ask myself at this moment, you know, Ibrahim, you know, what are you going to do? Are you going to allow this legacy to die here and now and be buried in the ground with your grandfather? Or are you going to pick up the banner for yourself and carry it forth into the future? And that was the beginning, I would say, of my transformation when I really start to, you know, bring out my Islamic identity and to be open about who I was as a Muslim. And, you know, I, was ch I began to chase that legacy that I was running from. I began to chase it for myself. And as Allah would have it, in his wisdom, I wasn't drafted to any NBA team at that particular time. In fact, I was sent across seas. My agents, they didn't tell me the whole truth. They said nobody was interested. And I found out years later that wasn't exactly true. But I went overseas. I began to refine and redefine myself and to study. You know, I remember I used to pray sometimes in the night for hours. You know, and I would be reading everything that I had ever memorized, you know, during that short time that I was in Morocco. And I was just trying to cleanse myself and to make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I'm going through that, he's putting barakah on the basketball court that I became the leading scorer in the Greek league. And only after four months, they were buying my contract in the Euro League in Italy. And he continued to bless me, right? But it's just as I said, the higher up you go, the thinner the air. Right. And so the more I begin to embrace my faith, I'm trying to stay on time, inshallah. The more I begin to embrace my faith and to hold fast to my identity, that's when the challenges really begin to come tougher and tougher. Right. Um, I actually took off a, a portion after my, I think, fourth year professionally. I took off some time. I went and made the Hajj. And then as soon as I got back from Hajj, the Houston Rockets called me. Right. They said, you know, they want you to come for the veterans camp. They're going to sign you. They gave me an official contract and I went down to Houston. And what's ironic is that when I arrived at Houston, I'm staying in a hotel. And on this side of the hotel is the stadium for the Houston Rockets. Um, and on this side is a conference convention center. Right. And the conference convention center has this big banner on it. And it says Texas Dawa. Right, Texas, Dawa, right, which is one of the major conferences that we actually have back home in the states. So it was still that Ibrahim, that Dawa, is still calling, right, even as I arrived in Houston. And years years later, I actually got invited to the Texas Dawa conference. And I guess what was ironic about it is I was staying in the exact same hotel, right? Subhanallah, right. I faced a few challenges while I was in Houston. Um, so there was actually a kid, he had Islamic background, he was Egyptian, <clears throat> and that he doesn't represent all Egyptians. <laughs> but he had almost completely lost all of his Islamic identity to the point that he would even criticize Islam openly. And one time we're sitting in the film room, and it's just me and him, we weren't allowed to practice that day because they were still going through some logistic paperwork, and a few other people who were part of the administration and this type of person, he just wanted to impress everybody that, he, that was around him. And so he says, you know, out of nowhere, yo, bro, you know, cut your beard. Yo, bro, yo, cut your beard, bro. Like, you know, trying to get some laughter maybe from the other people and so forth. And it wasn't the Wolverine, you know, that I have right now, right, the X-Men. But it was just like probably like a, a little bit here, you know, underneath, right? And it wasn't a significant beard. But... It offended me deeply, you know, and this is years later after I had kind of developed a little bit. And so 
I begin to address, address him in front of everybody, explain to him the significance of the beard. And then he said, man, you really believe in all of this stuff? Right? And then he started mentioning the hijab and questioning. And I started explaining to them, you know, the rights of women and the hijab and all. And it turned out to be like an alley-oop, you know, for the slam dunk, right, in terms of da'wah, because he was just feeding me questions. And everybody sitting there silently observing and watching and listening and learning about the reality of Islam. Right. And what's interesting about him is that a few days later, after he had watched me for a little while, he came to me in the hotel. And he said, man, I'm proud of you. He said, I, I got a lot of respect for you. Right. You're doing something that I can't do myself. This is what he said to me as we're parting ways in the hotel. Right. And that was, you know, like, subhanAllah, you never know, you know, what happens, you know, uh, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he's in control. Funny story, it's game night. We're going against the San Antonio Spurs. Um, this is the first exhibition game of the year. And um, it's pregame warm-ups. The gym is pretty much empty, except there was about, I, I didn't count, but maybe like 20 cheerleaders on the court. So I took a deep breath. I got the ball. I lowered my gaze. And I went as far as I could to the other end of the gym, right? And the other players are coming in, you know, they're pointing, they got their chins all the way down to the floor, tongue out, eyes this big, they're whispering to each other about the girls and stuff like that, right? And I just put my gaze down, I went down to the other end, and subhanAllah, that same brother, he came up to me, he said, how did you do that? You know, as if I said, you know, perform some type of miracle or something. <laughs> and he said, yo, you real, man. You are real. Right? And I had no idea that he was going to be watching me. Right? You never know who's watching. And I just learned something recently that when your intention is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, that's when he begins to put the barakah in your actions. That's when you begin to see the fruits of your work. Right. If I did that for anybody else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, perhaps it would not have been uh, imp impacted anyone else. And then I eventually left there. I have oof, nine minutes. Right. Time and score. This is like one of the major things as a basketball player. Time and score. You have to always be aware of time. Right. The game is on the line. We're up 20. We don't need to rush. Right. Or we're down five. We got to pick up the pace. And as the point guard, I was the timekeeper, right? So inshallah, we're gonna do it. We're gonna get to our destination, inshallah, right? Tamam. So as Allah willed, I would eventually uh, leave Houston. It was something so like divinely decreed that I, I had no choice to accept it and I didn't question Allah's decree, right? The Houston Rocket was vetoed by the NBA. They were not allowed to make any trades, meaning that they had too many players at that particular point, and those people who had what was called non-guaranteed contracts, they were the first ones to be released. So I ended up going back to Europe, to Lithuania, um, where I would basically finish my career. And um, a few things happened in Lithuania. I have a few stories. I don't know how I'm going to do it. So one day, we got film, we got team pictures today, right? So bring your uniform. So I put on my uniform in the locker room, and we go out to the court. And everybody's lining up for the picture, and we're about to take our team picture, you know, like the, the professional teams they do. And um, as soon as we get lined up and ready, somebody comes out of nowhere with a bag, and he starts pulling Christmas hats out, <laughs> hats out the bag. And we're already lined up nice and neat, right? And he starts handing out the Christmas hats to the players, right? And then he comes to me, <laughs> and I'm like, Abaddon, Abaddon, <laughs> right? As my, my other mother, she would say, over my dead body. Right? <laughs> Meaning that, you know, this is not going to happen unless you put it on my dead body, right? And I had to uh, stand my ground at that particular moment um, and say, you know, no, 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 no. And then I realized that I actually, it wasn't even appropriate for me to be a part of that picture. And so, you know, I informed the team that I wasn't going to do it. And other things happened, you know, to the point that my teammates, man, they said, you're so tight, man. You're so restricted. I said, no, y'all so loose. <laughs> y'all so loose, y'all don't have any constitution. <laughs> Show me in your book this type of interaction, 
right? And we used to have friendly conversations and, and debates sometimes, right? You know, one time we was at a dinner and it was a regular friendly team dinner and then it just turned into a concert. Just like that, right? Boom, boom, boom. And the lights. I said, we got to go, man. <laughs> my, me and my wife, I said, we got to get out of here. <laughs> right? I said, okay, I'll see y'all tomorrow in practice, right? And I got out of there in a hurry. Um, what happened my last year is that they changed the games from um, Wednesday and Thursday to Thursday and Friday. And so oftentimes I would be traveling on Fridays and I would be missing one my favorite, one of my favorite things in my life is, which is going to the Jumu'ah prayer. This is something that is very dear and beloved to me. I love it. You know, the imam gets up there, the, the, he says, Salaamu Alaikum, the Mu'adhan, he stands up, and he begins to call the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then the imam, he says something, you know, from the Quran that just reaches to you so deeply, I got to get my act together, right? I love that. Right. But traveling and playing on Fridays, it was difficult for me to make the Juma our prayer sometimes as a traveler. And I know I have the concession, you know, up until three Jumas and then you become blameworthy. And so one thing um, that happened is I, we go to Spain. We're playing Real Madrid. And I said, I'm going to make Juma today. I looked at the schedule. There was enough time. And I get to the masjid. Nobody's there. Right. What's going on? Where's the adhan at? They said, no, we pray at two o'clock. And so I was, I was at a fork in the road. I had to decide, am I going to stay here for the true victory or am I going to go back, you know, because you know, I was risking being fined, fired, you know, all of these type of things if I were uh, to neglect one of the team obligations. And that day I feel that I made the wrong decision. You know, I gave up the true victory for the false victory. At the last moment, I decided to go back to the team, right? And that night... As Allah decreed it, at the last moment, I gave up the victory in the game. SubhanAllah. Something happened. We were winning. We were about to take down Real Madrid, one of the best teams in the nation, uh, in the, all of Europe at that time, competing for the top eight teams in Europe at that time. And uh, I got tripped. My guy got the ball. He shot the three. And it went in. And we lost the game at the last moment. And for me, that was like, man you know, so deeply connected to me, leaving that, that masjid at the last moment, losing the true victory. And so that next week we got to Turkey. And I said, okay, I'm gonna get it this week, right? And there's masjids everywhere in Turkey, if you know. And um, as we're coming from team practice, I go to the front of the bus, the time for Juma is just about to come in, they're gonna start making the adhan. I go sit next to the coach, I say, I need to get off the bus, coach. You know, can I go to, to catch the, the Juma? And he looked at me and he said, no. And just before I was about to turn green <laughs> and, you know, Incredible Hulk, right? He showed me his teeth, you know, smiling, and he said, go ahead, All right? And so I got off the bus and I went and made the Juma, right? And that was Alhamdulillah, the true victory. And as Allah would have it, that was the last professional game that I played. That was the last professional game that I played. And many things happened after that that came to my decision to leave. Number one, as I have three and a half minutes left, my son was being born in Lithuania. And I remember sitting with my wife and talking and saying that, you know, I'm not really comfortable with him coming into the arena. You know, because I start to realize that every night is just one big party. The passing around the alcohol, you have, you know, the cheerleaders and they have on next to nothing. And then you have the music and then, you know, they were playing the English music and they weren't censoring anything. Right. And there were so many things going on in that particular arena. You know, I used to see the kids of the other um, um, players, you know, really enjoying that environment, the party, the party, the party. And I told my wife that, you know, I don't want uh, to bring my son into this arena. And that statement made me question my own place in the arena, you know? And I began to reflect deeply over a, a number of days, you know, I'm taking money from this place. I'm making a living here, but there's so much going on here that it is diametrically opposed to my Islam. And so I began to question my, my place in that arena. And um, I almost felt hypocritical, not almost, but I felt hypocritical taking money. Um, Allahu Akbar. Yazidu fil khalqi ma yasha. 
He increases in his, you know, creation, whatever he wills. They just gave me more time, right? Right? Or so they think, right? <laughs> um, and so I begin to see myself as a part of the machine that why are the people coming to this arena? Right? No, I'm not selling anyone alcohol. No, I'm not promoting gambling. No, I'm not doing any of these things directly. But the reality is that they're coming to that arena to see me and my teammates play. Right? So whether we like it or not, we are a part of the machine. Right? Um, and so that was something that you know, was going through my mind. And so I was sitting out um, the next game after the game in Turkey against F.S. Pilsen. And um, the coach, he came to me. And meanwhile, I'm thinking, you know, should I be, should I be here, right? And he said, um, in the locker room, the teammates are putting on their uniforms. And it was the first time that I noticed that on the uniform, there was a logo, Carlsberg. Anybody know what Carlsberg is, right? They got it in the hotel where we're staying at, right? It was the first time that I noticed that there was an alcohol logo on the jersey. Right, and I had worn that jersey before without even realizing that it was an alcohol um, logo and advertisement on the jersey. And one time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I forgot the jersey and I brought another jersey that we had that didn't have the logo on it. You know, he, he protected me from wearing it a second time. And the third time, I was sitting on the sidelines, right? But I had pretty much made my istikhara and was leaning towards a decision when my coach, he slid over to me because I still had to attend the game. And he said, Ibrahim, or he said, uh, Ibi, right? How can we use you more? Right? He's trying to pull me in closer and closer and closer. I said, SubhanAllah, this is shaitan. <laughs> He's trying to get me to go back on my, you know, my decision, you know. And this is a deep, thick conversation that, you know, I'm not even eligible to have. I don't put this decision on anybody else, right? But it was a personal decision that I made, you know, after consulting those people who I trusted and knowledge at that particular time, that I was going to separate myself from this situation and look for other opportunities. And so um, I eventually informed the team that I was going to be leaving, that I wasn't going to be continuing the season. It was not a very easy thing to do. Um, we were in the heat of the season competing literally for the top eight teams in all of Europe. And we had lost a few games, and so every single game was important. And we had developed relationships and so forth and so on. And I was the starting point guard. I was the starting, the leader of that particular team. And I had to break the news to them to tell them that because of everything that goes on in this arena, because of the alcohol and the advertisements and these type of things, I would no longer be staying, that I would be returning the money that they gave me, and I would be separating ways um, with the team. And that is how I, my professional career pretty much came to an end. Something interesting happened. Um, all of my teammates, they showed the utmost respect for me and the decision that I made. And that is because they knew that I was practicing, because I would stay with them in the hotels, and I would have to get up in the night and pray you know, why is that light on? You know, I would be bothering, disturbing them sometimes, but it's fudge time. I got to pray, right? And so they already knew what I was about. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he made, you know, uh, them, you know, respect my decision to the point that the coach came to me. And I think the decision that I made in Turkey to get off the bus really impacted him. And he said, you know, I was just going to invite you and your family to have dinner with me and my wife. And I wanted to know more about it now. You know, and that was like the only regret that I had, you know, in leaving is that I didn't get to talk to him more about about Islam. You know, um, I, I apologize for the amount of time that um, I've taken. A reporter from Greece, he just asked me, I don't know if you've heard about Colin uh, Kaepernick. He's the one protesting the American flag in the U.S. And he compared what I did to what Colin uh, CK, as they call him, is doing. But I said there's a little subtle difference, and I want us to be aware of this as Muslims as I conclude, is that he's protesting against something that is widely accepted as wrong, right? Police brutality, racism, and so forth and so on. But the stance that I took as a Muslim was against things that are widely accepted as right. Right, and that's what separates us as believers in the earth. We are strangers, and we don't always accept, uh, expect to be supported 
you know, in the decisions that we make for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he asked me if I had any regrets or if I was sad that I didn't get the type of publicity that CK was getting. And I told him no, because there's no regret in what you do for the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik wa nashadu an la ilaha na'at wa nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.